Well, welcome, welcome, guys. We are going to let everybody get joined here, and then we're going to get into some fun today. Hopefully, um, you have uh, uh, this piqued your interest a little bit. Uh, this is one of those talks that that uh, I enjoy because it's something that I'm passionate about. Um, it's something that I actually wrote a book about. And so this is something that um, I hope helps you to see not only church, but money, God, all of that in a little bit different way today. And so we're going to really dig into um, your overall beliefs or limiting beliefs about money. Uh, and about where you guys are going. We are coming into the end of 2024 extremely fast. Uh, if you guys have, I saw somebody posted today something about how the rest of the year seems like it's gone fast and November has been on like 2x speed. It's like just flying by. Uh, we're going to be at Thanksgiving and then boom, we're going to be into Christmas season. <laughs> so it's like, it's like everything is moving at light speed right now. Uh, so we're going to go in, we're going to dig a little deep today, we're going to look at a few scriptures, we're going to look at overall, uh, kind of the way money is mentioned and money is talked about through scripture, and then as we get further into uh, this topic, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna push a few buttons today. So be aware, think about as we talk, and as I talk about specifically about money and how you uh, respond or react. Um, I want you to think about the things that are floating through your mind today. What's pushing back against you? What are the thoughts that are immediately happening? What are And I'm going to ask some questions here in a little bit. They're going to make you think about things that have happened or not happened in your life, and they're going to help you to kind of see where are you at in the way you believe uh, about money and God. Uh, here's the truth is as you go through this process, whether you're owning your own business, whether you have a career, uh, whether you're starting your career, whether you're, I know we have some that are, uh, that watch these calls that are still in college and still trying to figure out what their career is going to be. I started over at 40 because I wasn't even sure what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, still kind of trying to figure that out. Uh, so uh, as we go through this process, our beliefs about money will guide so much of what we do. So your beliefs are going to drive your actions and your actions are eventually going to drive success or lack thereof. So whatever our beliefs drive as far as our actions go, that's going to make this cycle that's going to continue to happen. And so if we believe a certain way, if we have a limiting belief or if we have a belief that's causing us not to see the broader view, or if we believe, um, for instance, that God doesn't want the best for us, that's going to drive our actions. That's going to drive how we see the world. That's going to drive how we do our business or our career or how we handle our finances or how we handle investments or retirement or any number of things. And so as we get into this today, I want you to think about like where where do you feel that little quiet voice in the back kind of pushing back against either what I'm saying or what scripture says or, or all of that. And I would highly suggest that all of you go and do your own study, figure out this belief, because if you don't get a grip on your belief about money, you're going to struggle. You will self-sabotage. You will do all kinds of crazy things that you don't even realize that you're doing all related to your belief about money. So it's kind of fascinating to, to see how money affects us uh, and it's fascinating to see what it does or doesn't do, spe especially when we start looking at uh, entrepreneurship, because how you see money is how you're going to run your business. And so if you see a lack, you're always going to be in scarcity. If you see an abundance, you're always going to live out of abundance. So we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So I named this talk today, God needs builders or God's kingdom needs builders, not beggars. And here's why I named it this way. Uh, if you look at any of the stories, if we dig into uh, whether it's the parable of the minas, or the parable of the talents, any of those stories, if you look at even the Old Testament, it talks about lazy people. Like there is a very, God has very specific things to say about people that either hide it and don't use their talents or don't use what's been given to them or just don't even go do it. And so uh, when you look at those stories, there's very harsh language and very hard language about those things. And so I want to make sure today that we we talk about um, real life, 
that we look at this from not just the stance of uh, not just the stance of, hey, here's what could happen, blah, 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 blah real life. So I'm going to give you guys some real life stories, some real life things out of my own life today. We're going to talk about some of the students and different people that we've had. Like it's it's this is going to be a real talk today um, because what I've seen is when people connect the scriptures with what really is going on, like when they really look at what scripture says about money and they start to open their mind to what the bigger picture is, it starts to have breakthrough. And that's really where we want to get to today. So here's a question that I've asked oftentimes, and I've asked this before in different ways. Um, what is rich and what is poor? Because what is rich to you may be very different than what's rich to me and what's rich to somebody else. And what's poor to you may be different than what's poor to me or poor to somebody else. And so what I found is, and especially as I, many of you I know probably have been in the mission field or gone and done missions work, you know, when we used to go to Mexico, it always fascinated me. Uh, one year we went and they took us through cardboard housing and that's poor. Like these people literally were taking brooms and and brooming dirt floors to clean their floors. And that was something that just fascinated me as I looked at what they were doing and really the world that they lived in. They had extension cords ran and they would try to still, they, they would steal electricity from anybody that they could down to their house in their cardboard home. And they would have water hoses that were strung all over the place to try to get water. Poor is totally relative. Rich is too. So somebody that is like, if, when we say rich, you might be thinking somebody like Elon Musk or somebody that's like, like crazy rich, Bill Gates, right? Some of these people that have crazy money uh, or rich may be the guy that lives down the street from you that has a certain car or a certain kind of house or has a certain kind of job or business or whatever it may be. And so when we talk about rich or poor, we, it's very relative. It's very relative to what you believe to what you think it is, because it's a moving target. There isn't something that says this is rich and this is poor. It's a moving target, and it's all based on your belief, of what you think those two things are. And so the Bible has so much to say about money. We talk about all the time that, um, you know, Jesus talked about money more in Scripture than he talked about really any other topic. And yet, I don't know about you guys, but I, I've heard very few sermons on it. And if they are, it's usually about tithing. It's usually about giving. Nothing wrong with any of that. It's just that money controls so much of what we do and what we don't do, our ability to give, our ability to serve, our, our ability to create nonprofits or do other things, our ability to go and do things like when a hurricane hits or something like that, for us to be able to load up and just go do something to help. Ability for us to take care of health needs in our family like we do with my wife's MS. The ability to handle things like our kiddos going to college. Um, I would just posted something about that the other day. And I quit counting right around a quarter of a million dollars that we spent on our daughter to go through six years of school. By the time we moved her and the cost of all of the different expenses in school and vehicles and gas and travel and food and all the stuff that went along with it, there's, there's this massive expense that kind of comes along with that, right? And so as we look at money, um, I really want y'all to think about that. And I really want you to think about, are you doing what you set out to do? Many of y'all had dreams as kids. You thought, man, I want to be this when I grow up. Are you doing that now? Are you doing the thing that you thought you would do? I tell you what, man, I, I have gone all over the map. I Many of y'all know that I did 17 years of full-time ministry. We worked full-time in youth ministry. I worked full-time as children's homes. Uh, ran a children's home. I did all of that. And then we started these businesses about 10 years ago and it completely radically changed our lives. What was rich back whenever I was doing children's homework is very different than what I think rich is now. Because back when I was doing children's homework, uh, I was making about 50K a year as the CEO of the children's home. All of that was getting flushed right back into the children's home. Our life and everything was just completely consumed by that work. I loved it. I wouldn't have, I, I, I don't ever want to go back and not do the things that I did. I loved everything that I was able to go do. But I also had a very warped view of money. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. I'm going to tell you kind of the, the story of how everything happened with us. But I want you to think about like, if you were, um, this is something that was told to me the other day that I thought was just genius. 
if you were given value to me, so we did some work together, let's say, and you brought so much value to me, it was worth $10 million. Okay. So I've got some nice fake million dollar bills here. Maybe one of these days, if you guys ever see me, I'll give you a fake million dollars so you could be a millionaire too. So the, let's 10 million bucks, right? So let's say you did work for me. I gave you $10 million check, which some of y'all, I know we have some youngsters that watch these. They probably don't know what checks are, but let's say I gave you a $10 million check. So you took the $10 million check and you went down to your bank. You gave it to the teller and the teller's going, wow, that's a, you know, that's a lot of money. Congratulations, right? You put it into the bank. Teller lets you know, hey, look, it's going to take about 10 days for this check to clear. Check this size. They're going to have to check the other accounts. They're going to have to go through all this rigmarole, right? And about 10 days later, your, your money's going to clear. So let's say 10 days from now that you know that that $10 million is going to go into the bank account because of the value that you brought me. So you worked for me. I gave you a $10 million check. It went into your bank account. You're going to have this 10-day gap where you can't touch the money, but you know, you know without a doubt that you're going to be a 10 millionaire in 10 days. It's going to hit your bank account. I want you to think about how would you behave during that 10 days? How would you think differently? How would you deal with your family differently? Would you even tell your family that you just got a $10 million check? Would you scream it from the mountaintops or would you keep it private and to yourself? Would you go buy anything? What would you do if you knew 10 days from now, without a doubt, there's like, it's a guaranteed, it's going to go into your bank, 10 million bucks. When you think about that kind of money, for pretty much anybody on this call, $10 million would retire you forever. Like with $10 million, if you know what you're doing with investments, you never have to work again. And you could live a very, 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 very nice lifestyle <laughs> and give tremendously and do tremendously and go tremendously. Like you could do all the things that you ever dreamed of doing. But I want you to think about that 10-day window. What would be different if you knew without a shadow of a doubt that that money was going to go into your account? Because here's the reality, guys. Like there are things that change when we know when we know that we're going to get paid something like I, I'll give you a perfect example. Years ago, we were doing about 35, 40 K a month in our digital agency. We went, we had pitched this big, huge corporation. They were across nine states, a couple of countries. They had 300 plus locations. They'd come to us. We were going to do some marketing for them. And we had pitched them and we pitched them $45,000. I never pitched anything that big in my life. I think our biggest client up to that point is like three or four grand, 45 grand. I remember the day walking into that client's office, going and sitting down across from the president and the vice president and the marketing director. And I don't even know who else was in the room. I couldn't even tell you. I remember pitching this thing and them going, okay, we'll do it. Where do we sign? And I remember getting in the elevator because, man, everything inside of me just wanted to like, what? you're right, like jump up and down inside of that room and go crazy. And I remember getting in the elevator with my partner that was with me and both of us going, yes, right. But we were afraid there might be cameras or something in the elevator. So we were we were really trying to restrain ourselves because we knew with this one client, it could change everything. Not that we were doing bad. We were already making a lot of money. But this one client, we landed this one client. It took us from 35, 40K a month to 85, 90, 100K a month. Like it was crazy, the jump that it took. Our business radically changed. That's what I'm talking about. The gap in between there. So I knew the day that we signed that client, I knew that guess what? In so many days, we were going to have an ACH that was going to come in and hit our bank account. And it was life-changing money, not just a little bit, life-changing money. So I want to ask you a question. Would you be comfortable being a millionaire right now? And it's something that you really need to think about. And again, I want you to pay attention like to that voice inside of you that's either saying, oh, you can never do that. Or that's voice is saying, is that what God really wants for me? Is that even okay? Am I being greedy? 
Like pay attention to those voices as we talk today. Because those belief systems that are inside, that are unconscious, that you're carrying around with you, they're driving your actions. They're driving the way you talk about money. They're driving the way that you represent or you offer. One of the things that we see happen a lot when people join our training program is they go out and they charge somebody based on what they could pay. So when I started my very first client, I charged him $1,000 to build a website, which I thought was a crazy amount of money 10 years ago. And the guy literally goes, man, that sounds great. Because the guy across from me, he literally, <laughs> what's crazy is he said, he said, I already told the guy that I would do it for three grand. So $1,000 sounds great. <laughs> I left $2,000 on the table, right? But $1,000 was a large amount of money to me. So I didn't charge him what I really needed to charge him for the value that I was bringing to the table. So would you be comfortable being a millionaire today? Is that something that you could go, oh yeah, yeah, I could be comfortable being a millionaire. I don't change, right? Because I know whose I am and I know what I'm about in this life. And that's what we're gonna kind of talk about today is how this is working. So it always it's always kind of funny. Uh, you guys ever pay attention to like when you see something like, let's say you saw some guy driving in a Ferrari down the road or a Lamborghini or I don't know, whatever car, whatever car it is to you that's like out there. Do you immediately have a thought about that guy? Like, how did he get that? Or are you immediately jealous? Or you immediately think, man, that guy's got to do something scammy or whatever. Like, what's your thought when you see people? Maybe you don't think about them at all. I don't know. But we all have some pre-existing beliefs that we've built through time. And those beliefs are driving the way that we treat our money, our business's money, and all of that's driving what we're doing. If you think about who's usually the bad guy on TV, many times it's the rich guy, right? And so as you're thinking about these belief systems and you're looking at all of these things, what are your, what are your thoughts? Like if you saw somebody give a huge donation to some nonprofit, or church, or ministry, or maybe your favorite college. Like there's a guy that just gave 50 something million dollars to Texas Tech not too long ago. What do you think about that guy? Like I was sitting in a meeting the other day. I'm in a, I'm, guys, I pay a lot for coaching. If you aren't, if you're serious about being an entrepreneur, you need coaching because <laughs> This is a weird analogy, but as Keith Cunningham says, you can't smell your own bad breath. You need somebody to tell you that you have bad breath. You need somebody to tell you that, hey, you're you're dropping the ball here, or you're not making these steps, or you really need to do it this way, or you need to grow in this area, or your leadership needs to blossom in this area, or whatever, right? You need you need people in your life that can speak into you. So I'm sitting in a coaching meeting the other day. This guy pops on and he goes, that everybody that shows up, they give a financial win right off the bat. And this guy goes, yeah, we just got a new, we just moved something. And by doing that, we got a um, initial, like a, a sign-on bonus of $6 million. What if somebody came on this call today and they were given financial wins and somebody came on the call today and said, Man, I was given a financial uh, sign-on bonus for $6 million. Is there any immediate thoughts that come to mind for you? That's what I'm talking about. Like, are you happy for them? Are you kind of going, man, I wish that was me? Are you, do you kind of feel like, man, I wonder what they do? Like, what, what is, where your thought process go? Because we're going to talk about where the disciples' thought process went here in a minute in a story in scripture. Because we all have some kind of pre-existing belief. We all have these beliefs. Most of the time it came out of something that had to do with your family, like maybe the way your family, like my dad, he used to say goofy things like, uh, like if it rained on the other side of town, he'd say, well, they must pay the preacher a lot more over there. Like I grew up in like rural West Texas, man, oil field and farmland and ag. And like, that's the world I grew up in. My dad's old cowboy. He was three years old. The dude was on a horse. Like that's the way he just grew up. And that's who he was. And he would make these offhanded comments about money all the time. And, and it was kind of funny because when he went into the coffee shop, he owned a small business. And as he got older, when he went into the coffee shop, he always acted like the guy that was broke. 
And yet probably sitting around the table, he was probably one of the wealthiest guys sitting around that table. You would never know it. He wore the same old pearl snap button-up shirts and blue jeans and boots. Same guy. Didn't change anything about him. In fact, he drove an old beater Jeep because he just loved it. Thing would beat you to death going down the highway. It would bounce over shadows is what he would talk about. <laughs> it was bad. But our beliefs drive those things. So how we view money, uh, and especially how we view money as we're entrepreneurs or as we run ministries or as we run nonprofits, because how we view money is going to affect how we ask for money. So whether we're doing a transaction with somebody or whether we're asking for a donation, like when I was running the children's home, it always worried me to ask for huge donations. In fact, the guy that, there used to be a couple of guys that would sponsor a golf tournament every year. And it fascinated me. At that point in my life, I had never had more than a couple of grand in the bank account at one time. And usually that was gone within 30 days. We lived paycheck to paycheck. We barely scraped by. And I remember these guys walking in and they would cut checks for like the sponsorship for our golf tournament. And I used to be fascinated by that. I was like, how does somebody cut a check for five or 10 or 15 or $20,000 and not even... Like it wasn't a big deal for them. Back then I looked at that and I thought, how does somebody do that? Now I understand it on the other side because I've cut checks for things like that. But I didn't understand it over here because I was still living in a very limited scarcity mindset. I didn't realize that there was abundance all around me. I was living in this world where 50,000 was all I felt like I was worth. Because you will value yourself in crazy ways. And, and, and you're a child of the king. We have to remember whose we are. So as we're looking at this, I want y'all to make sure that we're thinking about um, those belief systems that are there. So I'm going to, we're going to talk through a few things. And then you guys just, especially if y'all are taking notes, I want you just to write down like what your thoughts are on some of this stuff. Have y'all ever thought about the fact that the Magi, like these, these Magi guys, right? These guys show up and they give Jesus all these gifts. Do you think it says they gave him gold and myrrh and frankincense, right? Which gold wasn't even the most valuable thing that they gave him at the time, which is kind of crazy to think nowadays. But they gave him these three gifts. Do you think they showed up and just gave them like a little bitty pebble of gold? And like it literally says in scripture that they popped open chests and gave these gifts to Jesus. Do you realize that these guys are dated all the way back to the time of Daniel? Do you realize their job was to go find the next king? They were known as king makers. That was their role. There are some scholars that say, and I don't know, I'm not a scholar in any of this stuff, but it's always fascinating to me to think about it. There's scholars that say that could have been upwards of two to three million dollars worth of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was given to Jesus at the time of his birth. Three million. I don't know. I know it had to have been some kind of value. You don't pop open chests. You're not kingmakers. And don't show up and don't give just little gifts. Oh, here's your little bitty bag of myrrh. <laughs> right? Here's your little bitty vial of frankincense. That's not how it works, right? That's not how you would make a king. Have you ever thought about the fact that they went off for three years Right? They left, went off for three years and lived three years off in Egypt and never worked, as far as we know, never worked for that three years. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus, you know, we always call him a carpenter. The word actually means, and Walt, some of these other guys in our group probably could even give us more definition of this, but the word actually means builder. It doesn't actually mean carpenter. They were actually builders. In fact, there wasn't even a Carpenter wasn't even really a word or term that was used in that day and time, in that place. And they were builders, and they they would build. So you think about house builder. You think about somebody that actually does that. Now, we don't ever talk about this, but Jesus had brothers and sisters, right? There were at least six kiddos in that family. And they were able to travel, had a home. They were entrepreneurs, Jesus' dad was an entrepreneur. Jesus eventually was an entrepreneur. He ran a business. You ever thought about that? Right? You ever thought about the fact that um, 
not only were they able to go do all that stuff and they were able to go travel, but I don't know that they were rich, but I don't know that they were poor. I don't know. What I do know is that there's more to the story than maybe what I've always thought. So let's just keep going. So Matthew was a tax collector, right? He had a big enough house that everybody was invited over and he had plenty of room. Yeah. What about all these fishermen? They all had boats. They all had businesses. They were all entrepreneurs. In fact, it talks about Peter and them came back after Jesus, right? This is three years into this thing. After Jesus was crucified, after everything happened, Peter comes back and his he gets on his same boat three years later and goes out and goes fishing. They were entrepreneurs. They had a business. And they're not the only ones. I mean, we've talked about Paul before on some of these kingdom calls. Have you ever thought about the fact that Paul not only took care of himself, it says he took care of his own entourage that was kind of kind of running around with him, his missions team. They say there could have been a dozen of them. There are some scholars that say it would have taken close to a million dollars a year. We, we kind of refer to it as Paul's tent making business, like it's no big deal. But who did he make the tents for? He made them for the Roman, like he would prepare and make tents for the Roman army. Like that's who lived in tents a lot of times. That's one of the people that he'd make them for. He was involved with vendors. He would buy supplies. Priscilla and Aquila taught him, right? They apparently were doing pretty well for themselves, too. All of these people, as we look at Scripture, many times, I don't know that we realize or we, we I've always had this image like everybody was poor. I don't know why, but that's just the image that I've always had. Maybe it was the little felt things that when I was a kid, I don't know, but I've always had these images that they were poor, but I don't know that that's really the reality. If you think about Jesus, he fed a dozen boys. They're pretty much teenage boys. They were running around. Have y'all ever had boys in your household? My mama, four, like, well, there's four of us. We ate. I don't even know how my mom and dad paid for the food in our house. <laughs> they fed 12 young men traveling around for years. That's a miracle in and of itself. Right? Like if you've got kids, you know. Or have you ever thought about the fact that they had a treasurer, which was Judas? Have you ever thought about the fact that not only did they have a treasure, it, which by the way, do you have a treasure if you don't have treasure? No. <laughs> it's kind of dumb, right? They had enough treasure that apparently nobody even realized that Judas was skimming off the top. It says that Jesus only knew that by divine, right? That's it. And even, even when Judas left, even when Judas left, when they were there having the Last Supper, the disciples all thought, oh, he's going to give more money away or going to buy more supplies. Have you ever thought about the fact that they had wealthy women that traveled with them to help support the ministry? Or the fact that in Acts 2, at the end of the chapter, it talks about all these people selling land and all that. Well, where did they get the land from? They had to have been fairly well off to have land and be able to sell stuff and give it away. And we, we have these ideas of what money is in Scripture. And our limiting ideas and beliefs of what money is like, I'll give you another one. It says that they gambled Jesus' clothes away. Now, in my mind, I've always thought that he probably wasn't dressed very nice. But why would you gamble clothes that weren't nice? I don't know. Just seemed kind of odd. Now, I'm not saying he was rich by any means. Maybe he was. I don't know. He could have been anything he wanted. What I will say is that I think a lot of times our idea of money and scripture, and specifically Jesus' disciples, the way that money's represented, is that money's bad, right? And we're going to look at the scripture where everybody always kind of goes to. We're going to quickly look at it because I just want to look at one thing because we talked about one of the things that I hit you guys at the very beginning of this call is 
this idea that we have these, we have a preconceived idea of what things are about or money is about or how things should, should like shake out. And the disciples did too. And so I want to make sure that we are representing things correctly, because if we're, if we have a, if we have a bad money view, like if you think that the rich is bad or that you having a lot of money is bad, do you think you're ever going to have a lot of money? No. Like, why do we think these ways? Because I can guarantee it's holding you back. So we were told, go and uh, many of us, I went to college for one semester and bailed. I was like, I'm done. I, I went back for a little bit later, but that was about it. But many of us, like our, my daughter, she went to college. She got a degree. She got a degree in something medical that she's been able to use, make crazy money, travel, do stuff that she wants to do. It's been it's been really fun to watch. Great, right? But is your degree what you're even doing nowadays? I don't know five years, 10 years from now that she'll still be in the medical field. I have no idea. She kind of wants to start a business. She's kind of got the same bug that her dad has and that my dad had. He wanted to start a business, right? My brother. He wanted to start a business like there's there's a um, there's just something that's inside of us that we want to be entrepreneurs. And I don't know if you guys have ever realized this. There's about four. They say there's about four percent of all the people in the United States that really are wired and, and want to be entrepreneurs. That's kind of crazy when you think about it. Four percent. And I'm one of those. Man, I love it. I love being a business owner. My dad used to say, yeah, some of y'all raise your hands. I like I love it. I love being a business owner and it's something that um, it's something that I wouldn't do any other way. I just out of curiosity, y'all put in, just put in the chat. Like, are you doing something that actually say yes or no? Are you doing something that actually is related to your degree or not? I'm just curious. You just drop in the chat because I'd be curious to see how many people actually are doing something that's related to their degree now and the people that aren't because most of the people that I know, they don't do anything that's related to their degree. They ended up going down a totally different path, totally different way, doing a totally different thing. So as you're thinking about what you set out to do initially, look at all the no's. No, 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 no. <laughs> right? As you set out initially to do whatever it is that you are going to do in your life, is it getting you to your goals? Because if it's not, why are you continuing to do it that way? This was the realization that I had. <laughs> not, I love that. This is a realization that I had years ago is I can create the life that I want. I don't have to live by whatever it is that everybody says that I should live like. I don't. I can choose to do whatever I want. We just spent, I'll give you a good example. We just spent 40 days on a health retreat for my wife's MS. We needed to go away, get somewhere where we didn't have any obligations and let her get treatment. And we went for 40 days. I would not be able to do that. I would not be able to take care of her health the way we do. We would not be able to get away and not have to worry about things if we weren't in a position financially and having the resources to be able to go do that. I wouldn't have been able to do that 10 years ago. We would have just struggled through it. We wouldn't even be able to do the treatments that we're doing right now 10 years ago because we wouldn't have the money to go do it. It's a different world when you create the world that you want to live in. And we're creating that lifestyle the way we want it instead of living in the way that um, maybe we were limited before. So I want to show you guys something. Let's share my screen here. Let's make sure. All right. So uh, we're going to look at the Rich Young Ruler. We've looked at this before. If you guys have ever, uh, if you guys haven't been on pre uh, previous Kingdom calls, you can look. Uh, look for digital storefronts on YouTube. All of them are there. You could watch all of the past kingdom calls. Um, man, this is something that's just fun for me. I get to take scripture and combine it with business and we get to talk about it from a different angle. So today I, I just want to, I, I want to focus on just one little piece of this uh, story. So you guys know the rich and ruler story. I'm going to read down through this and then, um, and then we'll we'll finish down here on 31. So in verse 17, this is, um, as you can see, this is Mark 10. I think we're in, yeah, we're in ESV on this, uh, on this verse. 
Mark uh, 17 says, uh, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him. I love that. Loved him. No, there wasn't any bad anything. He loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So we, we see this rich young ruler guy come to him and says, hey man, what should I do to inherit eternal life? We know that he's a believer. We know that he's been doing what he thinks he should be doing. He, we know that he's been following some of the commandments, right? He got a few of them a little mixed up. He had an idol there in money. Jesus immediately saw that, told him, hey, you need to go get rid of this stuff because this stuff's becoming, right now, it's coming before God. And um, you need to go get rid of it. You need to go get rid of it, give it to the poor. Uh, and he, this has always been interesting to me. It says, sell all that you have. It doesn't say give all to the poor. It just says give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. He tells him this. And then this is the part of the story that I want you to think about. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? So you can imagine, I want you all to think about where the disciples are coming from. Anybody that was anybody in the Old Testament, all your big names, right? Abraham, Job even, right? Abraham, uh, Joseph, Solomon, David. These were all very, very wealthy people. All super wealthy people. In fact, Abraham, in spite of things that he chose, like he chose the desert over, like he let Lot choose the, the valley with water and all of the good stuff. And he chose the desert over here, knowing full well that God would take care of him, would increase his flocks, take care of him. They knew that this idea was that if somebody was doing what God called them to do, that he would bless them. That's how they're coming into this conversation. So they're looking at this dude going, oh my goodness, God must be blessing this guy richly, right? And then Jesus tells them, tells the guy, go sell everything, give to the poor, come follow me. The guy turns around and leaves. He turns to his disciples and he says, how difficult will it be for those uh, that have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to the, them again, Children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go to the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Because in their minds, they're thinking, look, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, God's going to bless me. Like this guy must be richly blessed because he's doing what God's called him to do. And that wasn't Jesus's point, but that was their belief. Their belief was tied. They had this belief that was tied to if they're doing this, then they're going to get this. And that's not the way it always works. <laughs> Just ask any of the prophets. <laughs> Those poor guys. I mean, that was that was they were not wealthy in any any form or fashion. Right. Jesus, <laughs> he tells them this. He tells them that it's it's impossible, basically. Right. They asked, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Remember, Peter had a business. Peter had a wife, right? Peter left everything to come follow him. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many are, uh, who are first will be last and the last first. So we have this, um, we have this experience that happens with them watching this whole thing happen with the rich young ruler, 
Um, and then we have the disciples asking. Jesus asks them first, right? He he says, how difficult is it going to be for somebody that's wealthy, right? Because we know what the trapments are. Look, guys, if you haven't, I'll show you in a minute. Like, we know what the entrapments are. We know where the struggles are. We know that we need guardrails in our lives. We know that we know that there are things that we need to make sure. And if you guys are, if you're surrounding yourself with people that can hold you in check, that you can be real with, that know your situation, like I have a lot of advisors and they know exactly where I'm at financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. These people speak into my life. I'm transparent. I open the I open the whole door and say, hey, look, I want accountability. Right? I want to make sure that I've got those guardrails. And Jesus tells them, he's like, look, with, without God, it's not possible. But with God, everything's possible. Peter's sitting there going, yeah, but I left everything. Just going, yeah, that's great. And because you left everything, here's what's going to happen. Right? He tells him, that's, we, we've got to give up our stuff. We've got to put God first. Here's the problem. Right, money is um, money's neutral. It just is. Money's neutral. It has. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. It's just a way for us to. And it doesn't matter if it's money or if it's anything else. It, it's just a way for us to barter to to exchange. It's just neutral. It magnifies who we are. For the rich young ruler, he had put money first. He had done all these other things, but he had put money first. And it was way more important than apparently God was to him. Jesus knew exactly where he needed to go. Now, what's fascinating to me is this is the only story ever in the New Testament where Jesus says, go sell everything you got. Come follow me. It's the only one. Think about all the other rich people that he comes into contact with. There's bunches of them. There were, with, like I say, there's wealthy women traveling with him. He never sold, he never told them to go sell everything he got, give it to the poor. This is the only time he does this, is this one story, because he knew he needed to set a present and he needed to help the disciples. What we didn't read is right after that, as the disciples traveled along, they they were actually fearful. Like there was a little bit of, ooh, right? They were amazed and they were a little fearful. They started to see who Jesus really was and they started to see the commitment that they were going to have to make and they started to see where things were heading. We do the same thing. Over and over in the New Testament, we see Jesus come into contact with rich people. Many times, even... Even the stories that you guys are familiar with. And he uses these stories. We've covered the talents. We've covered the minus. He rewards those people. He rewards the guys with the minus that actually created more minus, right? More money. He re rewarded that guy with actually control or power over cities. It's, it's a whole different way of looking at money. It's kind of crazy. Um, it's kind of crazy when we think about what all money affects. Uh, I'm watching friends of mine right now. I'm at that age now where both of my parents have passed. Uh, and I'm at that age where we've already gone through the nursing home thing. We've already gone through the medical thing. We've already gone through all that stuff. And it was not fun. And it was hard. And it was expensive. My dad not only paid for a nursing home for my mom, but he didn't believe the nursing home was actually checking on her. So he paid somebody to sit with my mom during the daytime because he wanted somebody there with her all the time. So he paid the nursing home a crazy amount of money. And then he paid this young lady to sit with my mom and just be there for her throughout the day. Like think about all the different things that money affects. The stresses and the joys the goods and the bads, right, that come along with it. But money itself is just neutral. It's neither good nor evil. It just is. And how we believe is going to have a whole lot to do with that. And who we hang out with is really going to affect how we believe money is and what we believe money is supposed to be used for and how it's supposed to be used and how much is rich 
And how much is poor? If you're hanging around people that are multimillionaires, and it's normal for them to go do things that a multimillionaire would go do, it's a very different world than hanging around somebody that is struggling in scarcity, like I was 10 years ago, worried about paycheck to paycheck. It's a very different way of thinking about things. It's a very different way about thinking about money. It's a very different way of thinking about what should I do with my money or how should I spend my money? It always fascinated me. We'd have girls come to the children's home. Some of these girls were homeless, right? They came from underneath a bridge or whatever. They would always have a cell phone. And I was like, how did they get a cell phone? How do they pay for the cell phone? How did they pay for the month? Like, it always fascinated me. They couldn't find a place to stay normally. And they never stayed anywhere very long. And they struggled a lot of times with food and other things. But they always had a cell phone. It was just fascinating to me to watch. And again, that's a belief. There's a belief inside of them that says that this is, this is a have to, right? And these are just maybe wants that don't meet up to this have to. So when you're thinking about how you view money, um, I want you to think about like, it, it affects all these different areas of our life. You're going to be the average of the people that you hang out around with. You just will. And so if you're hanging around a bunch of people that are struggling and live in scarcity, that's the belief system that you're going to have too. If you hang around a bunch of people that see abundance everywhere, that's the belief system you're going to have too. And when I get into rooms where I'm the, like, guys, I do well. We do well for ourselves. And, and we've we've been blessed beyond. And it's not me, man. God's opened doors that I'm like, I don't even have a clue how that even happened. Uh, I can guarantee you this ball guy is not that smart. And yet I, I have been in places and done things that has opened the doors to allow me to, to see and experience and do things that I'm like, this is nuts. Like, I, and when I get into a room, like I sat down at a table at an event a couple of years ago, the guy that was sitting next to me, I didn't realize this until later. The dude was a billion. Well, I've sat down in two of these rooms like this where there's two guys sitting next to me that were both billionaires. You don't think that guy thinks a little bit differently? The guy thinks very differently in the way he views everything from how he spends his time how he spends his resources. Like I've asked this question before on calls. Am I rich because I have a maid or do I have a maid because I'm rich? That's two very different things. Because the guy that has money and resources and understands his value understands that it's it's better for me to pay the, the maid to come clean than it is for me to spend my time doing that because my time is more valuable to spend over here to increase whatever, my business, my ministry, my nonprofit, whatever it is that I'm doing. We have to understand what our value is. And again, it all circles back to our beliefs about money. So let's talk some real talk. I've taught thousands of people right now how to be online and create income. Literally thousands at this point. From the time that I started and we started having success, I spoke in Vegas. I led high-end training from about two years into this thing. About five years ago, we started digital storefronts. I, before that, I started marketing with a mission, taught ministers only. That's the only people I worked with for a while. Many of these people have retired. They've retired their spouses. They've gone on the mission field. They've helped with their churches, they've built churches, they've built houses, they've gone over and done all kinds of crazy things in other countries where they've been able to give. We've got one guy that goes and does um, like all this stuff in in uh, Pakistan and, and there's other people that do stuff in other countries. Like it's so cool to watch how this has changed all these different people and blessed all these different people. But our beliefs about money are going to hold us if we don't Pay attention to them. And especially if you guys can't wrap your minds around, I can be a millionaire. I am a millionaire. 
It's going to be a struggle for you to ever be a millionaire. And some of you have god size dreams and callings. And you've been called to do crazy cool things. We have one guy that's in, in California. I don't get to talk to him very much anymore because he's so busy. When he very first called, this was back when we were very kind of first starting doing all this stuff. And I, I don't know why, but I ended up with, I was the guy that was doing the calls back then. I got on a call with him and we talked about what we're doing in our, our work. He was a state, he was planning a church in California, which if you guys, I mean, just think about that. He's planning a church in California. He's, uh, he's not only planning a church, but he has a small family, uh, with little kids and his wife's having to work outside the home. So he's the one that's staying at home with the kids when she can't be. And then, uh, he's also doing the church plan. And basically he got on the phone with me and he was like, look, here's where I'm at. We can't keep doing this. There's not enough money. We haven't been able to get the funding. I've got to figure out a different way to do this ministry. And I was like, okay. No problem. Like, this is what I do. And this is how I do it. Do you think you can do it? And he goes, yeah, I think I can do it. He joined. We got started. <clears throat> it wasn't too long after that. I'm talking to him and, and he's like, man, you wouldn't believe what happened. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, everything's changed. He said, I don't even take money from any of the donors anymore. He said, we are now giving money back to the church. It's changed everything. And he started this whole movement of entrepreneurs within churches in California. And they were having these big, huge gatherings to bring all these entrepreneurs together because that's what he felt called to do. And I was just going, wait, you did all of this? Like this was all within a year and a half, two years. You did all of this within this short time frame, going from, I can barely afford to live here and we're going to have to shut the church down and move to now I'm able to go do these big events and do all this stuff. And he's going, yeah, he said, God opened doors and it's like, boom, things just happened. Now, he put the time, he put the effort, he put the energy, he worked it hard. He wanted to own a business. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. We have to have a vehicle to get to where we want to go. And so when you're thinking about your money beliefs, I'll, I want you to think about, does this resonate with you at all? So 10 years ago, when we, we were doing ministry work, we were actually at a children's home. I was planting a thrift store at a children's home in Colorado, my wife and I both looked at each other and we were like, we got to do something different. At that point in time, we were barely making, we were barely making enough to live. We basically were making enough to kind of live. And then a little bit was going on a credit card every month. And we were broke to the point where I had to call my dad and go, look, I'm embarrassed to even do this, but I need money to move. And dad was like, how much you need? We talked about it. Ended up getting, moving back to Texas, and we started our first business, which was a safety supply store, which is what my family had done since I was young. Oil field related, OSHA related equipment, that kind of junk, right? So we start that, and we kind of get going on that. And my very first goal with when I started doing this internet online business, because we went for a while, and then I was like, man, gotta, there's got to be a better way to do this. My very first goal with the internet business was to get to 15K a month because my wife and I wanted to do ministry without taking a paycheck. That was our goal when we started all that. We had done ministry all that time, taking a paycheck. And we were like, look, let's go start something that we can do, that we can control, where we don't ever have to ask anybody for money. We don't have to take money from the church or nonprofit or whatever. And we can just go do ministry work. And that was 10 years ago. And my very first goal was 15 grand a month, which we had never seen that much money in our lives. I, it just, that was just a lot of money to us. So we started initially running the safety supply company, and then we ran this digital agency. We got the digital agency up to about two to four K a month by the end of the year. This was June, July of 2014. At the end of the year, we were doing about two to four K a month. And then we had our, our oil filled safety business up around 30, 35 K, which was great. It just has a whole lot of cost of goods and all kinds of other stuff. So by the time that you took everything out of it, there wasn't really a whole lot left. In that. And I was doing running around all over the place. And then the oil field crashed. And if you, if there's anybody on here that's been a part of the oil field or lives in Texas or any of the other States that are supported by it, you know, like, it's like this, man, it's a wild ride. Oil field crashed. 
Corey's income went from 30, 35K with the oil field to 15K overnight. A couple of companies bankrupted. Like it was bad. Like just like that. I had to make a decision. We had bills to pay. We had racked up debt starting these other companies or this other company. And I was like, we, we need to make a decision. What are we going to do? And I set a goal to do 30, uh, 30 days. I set a goal to do $10,000 because I, I, I still thought I could do it. But here's the problem. I didn't think I was worth $10,000. Just being real. Like I didn't, I honestly didn't think I was worth the 10 grand a month. At that point, I just didn't have the belief. I don't know about y'all. I tried all kinds of junk, man. I had done MLMs. I had done, I don't know. I'd done all kinds of craziness. Sold insurance. I don't know if any of y'all ever sold insurance. I've sold insurance. I've done all kinds of stuff through the years. Sold different kinds of stuff. Got involved in this. Got involved in that. Never really made any money at any of it. I'd tried my hand at doing some other kind of marketing before. Never made any money at it. And I thought, man, we've got to do this. And my limiting beliefs of what I was worth were holding me back. But I knew that I didn't have any choice. Because at that point, it was either we're going to pay the bills or we're not. And it took me 37 days and we did $10,000. And there was something that just flipped. There was like a light switch inside of me that said, hmm, if I could do $10,000, I can probably do 15 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100. It was weird. It was like all of a sudden I saw that I could do this. And the next month we went to 15 and the next month we went to 20 and the next month we went to 25. And within a year we were doing 30, 35K and that's when we hit that big, huge client and we went to 90, 100K a month. And all of that happened within about a two-year window. And I look back and I think my money beliefs, if I would have held on to that scarcity mindset that I had before, we wouldn't be where we're at right now. I wouldn't be, we wouldn't have spent four and a half years in an RV getting to travel around and support churches and camps and nonprofits and doing all kinds of craziness. We wouldn't be in Lubbock doing what we're getting to do now to where we get to go and help with the college group here. I love working with college kids. Man, they're so much fun and they're so real. They don't let you buy with anything, man. They're just going to call you out on it. And so they're just going to tell you like it is. And I love it. I love every second of it. I just had one of them running around here a minute ago. He's heading off to go get his hair cut because he's going home this weekend. Um, that's what we want to be able to do. And that's what we wanted to do. And that scarcity mindset kept me trapped for so many decades because I didn't realize the abundance that was truly out there. And when we look at scripture and we look at everything that's happened, guys, look, 2025 is coming fast. If you guys stay doing the same pattern and the same routine that you've been doing, you're going to get the same results. Let's, let's just call it what it is. You guys need to plan out ahead and go, look, 2025, I want to hit this number or I want to be able to do this thing or I want to be able to go travel here or I want to be able to go do whatever it is. If you... If you haven't spent the time and look ahead and look out and go, look, here's where I want to be, and then work your way backwards and start looking at what do I need to do daily? We call them non-negotiables. They're daily non-negotiables that you need to decide that I'm going to either do these or not do these. And if I'm going to do these, I'm going to stick to it. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter my kids puking their guts up. It doesn't matter if the, if it's a holiday, it doesn't matter if it's the weekend, it doesn't matter if I just don't feel like it today, I'm going to do these things every single day of the week. If they're going to get me to the goal, right? I work out three times a week and then I walk the other days. I work out with weights three times a week and then I walk the other days, right? Those are non-negotiables for me. When I get to the point where I have grandkids, guess what? I want to be able to go do crazy stuff with them. When I went to Hawaii with my daughter and she's talking to her friends, she said, hey, we're going to go do the hike that goes through these blah, 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 back to this black sand beach that's back here and all this stuff. And her friends were going, your dad, he's like 50, right? Like, he's not going to be able to do that. And she goes, my dad's in better shape than I am. 
<laughs> like, I want to be able to, like, I love skiing and I love, like, you guys know, I love to fish. If you've been around me at all, like we were on a boat in Hawaii fishing for 16 hours between two boats. We wanted Marlin, man. I wanted to pull one of them big boys in. Like we spent some time fishing because we could and we wanted to. And I want to be able to do those things. So health's a priority. If I know health's a priority, then I'm going to make non-negotiables every day to make sure I get to my health goals. We should do the same thing in our spiritual walk. We better be doing the same thing in our money. Whatever it is that our goals are for our entrepreneurs, like whatever it is your business is. If you're doing digital storefronts, great. You better have some things that you're non-negotiables every single day. If you're doing something else, you better have some non-negotiables every single day. What are you going to do on a daily that's going to get you to the result? If I don't work out and I don't eat right, like I just did a, just fact, it just came in right before I got on this call. I just did an insurance exam. Uh, Three years ago, I was on high blood pressure medicine. I was on cholesterol medicine. I was on all kinds of craziness, maybe four years ago. I got fed up with it. I hired a trainer. This dude was from like Spain or something. The guy is amazing. All he works with are old dudes like me. <laughs> like He's like, I only work with entrepreneurs that are over 40, that are focused on their businesses and have neglected their health. And I'm like, that's me. Within a year, I was off all that stuff. I just took the blood test for my life insurance stuff that they just came and did the exam. Every bit of it, all normal, right down the line. Don't take any meds anymore. That's that's the kind of stuff that we've got to change, right? If we're going to get to that guy, if Corey's going to be that guy, I've got to make sure I'm doing daily non-negotiables. Guys, and if we don't believe that we can be a millionaire, or that we could be a 10 millionaire. I'll push you guys. Like, what, what, what's your worth right now? If you said this is as high as I could go, what does your thermostat say? Because some of you, I, I bet money, you, you haven't thought about this stuff. And if you don't think about it, guess what? 80, 90% of everything we do today, like everything that you did today, 80 to 90% of it was unconscious. It's beliefs that are floating around in the back of your head that have been there forever that you have ingrained, that you've put in there, and you have all of these things that say this is the way it is. Doesn't have to be. Choose a better belief. Choose a better meaning. Choose a different strategy. Right? Choose a worth that makes sense for where you want to go. Some of you, God has implanted a dream to do something crazy. And some of y'all have never gone all in. I've told you guys before, and I know Walt's heard me say this many times and others that have been on here that have been with me a while. My goal with all of this digital storefront stuff, we didn't even have to start digital storefront. Look, we did all of that because I kept getting asked. People were going, how are you doing this? How are you doing this? How are you doing? I finally got tired. I was like, okay, fine. We'll just... We'll do a program <laughs> because there wasn't, there wasn't anybody focused on kingdom minded people. They're just, and they're still not that I know of that are doing what I do. There wasn't anybody that said, look, this is about a bigger purpose. There, this is about not just drilling. I've, I've used this analogy before. We drilled a couple of wells in Africa this year for a um, couple of villages that have to do with kids and adults that are special needs. Do you realize that they chain them to trees over there because they think they have demons in them? They do crazy stuff to people that have special needs. I'm like, that's nuts, man. Let's do something. And so the, the organization that I partnered with, we were able to drill a couple of wells and do some stuff with them. And like, it's exciting, but what if we could just drill them all? What if we didn't need to just drill two? What if everybody on this call, which I don't know how many is on the call right now. I looked earlier, there was 30 something people. Yeah, there's almost 40 people on the call right now. What if everybody on the call had $10 million in the bank? How different would your church look? How different would your ministry look? How different would your family look? Scripture says that we should leave an inheritance to our kids' kids. 
is your current career or your current whatever it is that you're doing going to get you there? Because if it's not, what do you need to do to change that? Look, we have to start making some different decisions on a daily basis. We have to have some non-negotiables that say, look, today I'm going to get up and I'm going to make these I'm going to make sure these things happen every single day, no matter what. I'm going to work out or I'm going to do this for my spiritual walk. Or I'm going to do this for my business every single day. No days off. And until we make that kind of commitment and that kind of decision, guess what's going to happen? We're going to keep getting the same results we've been getting. I'm going to still be on high blood pressure medicine and I'm still going to like you think it. that was totally uncomfortable for me when I started working with that trainer. And you know what he made me do this? Oh, every week I had to send a picture in and he would like he would go, OK, let's see how far you come. And man, that was uncomfortable for me. It just was. Since that point, I probably lost right around 30 pounds since I started working with him quite a few years ago. And I've kept the weight off and I put more muscle on. And I still have bigger goals, right? There's other goals that I have now that I want to make sure that I hit. Until we make the decision, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to go all in. We're going to keep taking the high blood pressure medicine. We're going to keep taking the cholesterol medicine. We've been doing, I don't know if y'all have heard of the carnivore diet. That's what the doctor recommended my wife do for her MS for a time, only about three months until we reset her body. I told her, I'll do it with you. Craziest thing I've ever done. All you eat is meat and animal products. Very bizarre. No veggies, no fruits, none of that stuff. And the first few meals we were going, this feels so weird. And like, they just slap a big old piece of steak down in front of me. And I'm like, okay, I love steak. I'll eat ribs and steak and barbecue and all that goodness all day long, right? And we've been doing this now for about 60 days. My wife's lost 27 pounds. She's starting to get feeling back in her body that she hasn't had in years because of her multiple sclerosis. Things are shifting and changing rapidly. All because we made a commitment and said, this is what we're going to do. She hasn't had sugar. I haven't had sugar in 60 days, right? When we make a decision, we've got to make a decision and just go for it. So will your current activities get you to where you want to go? Because if they won't, I don't, I don't know what brought you to this call today, but if your current activities aren't going to get you to where you're going to go, what are you going to do to change it? Our money beliefs that we have are driving everything. If you guys haven't read, I don't know if I can get it in here. I hope, oh, there we go. To love is to give. I wrote this, this launched during the summer. I haven't really talked about it since. It went straight to the top and was a bestseller for a couple of weeks. And then I haven't talked about it again. To love is to give. It's on Amazon. You can buy it. Look, I wrote that book because I have, I had money beliefs that I had to get through. I had to get like, I had to work them out because there was a part of me that, that felt like it was wrong for me to have money. And that's not what scripture says. You need to think about how your belief is affecting your business, your life, your family, your future. You need to make daily non-negotiables that you're going to do that are going to drive you to whatever it is that you're trying to get to. I'll give you one thing. If you guys want, you guys know Black Friday's coming. Uh, for any of you that are in digital storefronts, I've got some stuff coming for you guys that are. We're going to do three master classes. going to blow your mind. They're coming over the next few months. You're going to have some fun. And it, it's not just about a business. That's the cool part about this, guys. We're going to. Yeah, it's going to be fun. For any of you guys that came to this call and you're like, look, I don't know anything about like I, I don't I'm trying to figure out where to go. Digital storefronts might be a way for you to do that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's something else that's better out there for you because of the way you're wired or things you like or whatever. Um, here's what I'll tell you, guys. Black Friday's coming. We put together a whole bonus package. These calls that I was just talking about are only going to be available to people that are on inside of DSF right now and people that get on a Black Friday. After that, it's going to be cut off, and then I'm going to charge for them. 
because we just want to bless everybody. I want to bring as many people along as we possibly can. If we can get as many people as we possibly can to this point, then we can have some fun. Then it's about let's load up a bunch of people and go to Africa and go drill the wells ourselves and go have some fun. You know, the craziest part about the drilling the wells in Africa, the guy calls me and he says, hey, I want to tell you a story. So I get on with him and one of the board members. They rounded everybody up in the village to launch the, the well. It was a big deal. They had music and food and like this was a big deal. They didn't have a well like at all. They had to hoof water in all the time. So they bring everybody in. The gospel message that is told that day is the woman at the well. So this guy goes about preaching the gospel. And the guy goes, you wouldn't believe. He said over 100 people came to Christ that day. And I was going, are you kidding me? I'll do that as many times as I can. I'll drill as many wells as I can. If I know it's going to make that kind of impact. That's what we need. That's the change that's going to make the difference. Because it's not just about having the money. Money is just neutral, man. It's just a tool. But you need a vehicle to create the resources that you need to be able to go do the things that you want to go do. So find you a vehicle. Commit to your not like, make sure that you have non-negotiables every day. Make sure that you're doing things that are going to drive you towards the thing. And if you don't have a vehicle, look at digital storefront. See if it's something that you want to do. If it's not, great. Find something and come back and tell me. I want you on these calls either way. I don't care. Look, I'm just looking for kingdom-minded people. I want people that are serious about making a difference in the world. Because I would love for us to go do some crazy cool things that nobody else is doing. And I think there's a lot of you on the call that that resonates with. You're like, I'd like to do that too. So uh, I've got Evie on the call. I think she's, uh, yeah, I think she's already hit a few people that were commenting. Guys, if you want the, if you want the stuff that's happening, look, does it, here's the deal. I've been doing this for 10 years. The process that I teach works. And that's just one business that we have. Some of y'all know that we started an epoxy flooring company. I've got a coaching event company. I have another training company where we teach mindset and business. We just went through a whole new thing that we're launching before long. It has to do with how you actually structure your time and work through like your personality type inside of your, not your life, how you actually use things. Like I've got all these other things that I do now. It's not just one thing. I stink an author now and all these things and all these doors are opening and all this stuff has been just a blast. I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago with went out to hundreds of thousands of people. I'm just having fun. Because I found a lane that fits me and that I can go be Corey, right? I can, I can live inside the gifts that God has created and given me. And that's what I want to find is people that like, let's go find where your gifts are and let's go blow those suckers up, man. Let's go use the gifts. Let's go 10X those things, just like the parable of the talents. Let's go take and get enough, right? Get enough resources, get enough everything that we can go change some people's worlds. A few years ago, we sat down at one of our big events. We had a few hundred people there. We had a panel up front and the people were asked, what do you really want to do with the resources that you've created? Well, one of the guys sitting on the panel, he's a youth minister. He still does youth ministry full-time. He's a trainer inside of our organization. I've known him for decades. Like he, in fact, he was, when he started looking at digital storefronts, he was going, I don't believe you're making that kind of money. Like he was just outright about it. Like, I don't, and he knows me. Like we, I, my daughter was in his mom's class at school. Like this wasn't anything new. He knows me. And so <laughs> we're having this conversation and I'm looking at him now and he goes, man, I've like tripled my income of my job. He's still doing full-time youth ministry does this on the side, and he teaches inside of our training. And I, we asked him, what would you do? Like, as you have success, what is it that you really want to do? And he said, I just want to, I want to have enough resources that I can bless other youth ministers that are getting into ministry. 
And for all of you that are in ministry or around that world, y'all know that it's getting harder and harder and harder to find people that want to do ministry full time. And he's like, I want to be able to go bless youth ministers. I just want to bless them. Like, however I need to bless them, whether it's training, whether it's helping them with finances, whether it's helping them to maybe find the job or keep the job or help with the kids or I don't know, whatever. I just want to be able to go do that. Another one said, I want to be able to go and just pay people's mortgages off without them knowing it. It's like, how cool is that? Right? I don't know what the dream is that you have, but let me tell you something. There is an abundance. There just is. When you tap into that and you finally realize that you can go create and you can go build, and you can go grow something that gives you the ability to travel and do all those other things, it changes everything. It just changes everything. And for all of you that maybe already have a business or something, and you're looking for something to tack onto it, it's a great thing to do that. We have a lot of business owners that do that. And again, I own multiple businesses now. Like I have all of these other things that I do now, and it all started from me starting my digital business because it gave me the cash flow to grow this. One of the businesses I have, I work with one of my students. Uh, we partnered together on some stuff. He was a student that was in our Young Life group. He was like 21, I think, when he met me. He would come over to the house. We'd do Bible studies and all that for Young Life. And one day he asked me, he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, this is what I do. And he goes, well, I want to do that. I'm like, okay, I don't really have a course yet. <laughs> this is when I was starting to create the course. Eventually got the course up. He joined that kid will do about four to $5 million across his businesses this year. He's 27. What are you waiting for? What's holding you back? And it doesn't have to be digital performance, guys. It doesn't matter what you do. Like you need to find something, go all in, make your non-negotiables and go for it. All right. I've taken a ton of your time today. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Man, this has been a blessing to me. I hope this has blessed you. I hope this has helped you guys. Because there is so much that we can do in this world and, and it's unlimited. We have to see, like, we have to start seeing that this is possible. This isn't a dream that just is out there. It's totally doable. Anybody on this call, anybody watching this later, like it's, it's totally within reach. We just have to see abundance. We have to start living within our gifts. Start focusing on the things that we are really like gifted to go do. Like that, those are things that we need to start making sure that we're doing. Guys, set your non-negotiables. Make sure that you're not, like you're coming into the end of 2025. Use it. This is one of, if you guys are in any kind of business right now, this is one of the most productive times of the year for business. Business owners are looking at their budgets. They're looking at how to cut their taxes. Like this is for a digital agency. There have been there have been ends of the year that I've done six figures easily, and we take a whole week off. We take off the last week of the year every year. It's abundance. It's abundance. We just need to go get it. All right, you guys have a blessed day. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Y'all have a beautiful weekend. Have a happy, happy Thanksgiving if I don't get to see you again. It's great to see all of y'all's faces today. Y'all be blessed. And I will see you guys hopefully inside of one of the groups.